Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the biophysics seminar. Our uh, speaker today is Alex Mogilner of NYU, and he will give a tutorial and a talk. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, we will leave the questions for the end. You can type them in the chat. Um, and um, Alex, thank you for uh, agreeing to speak. And uh, please go ahead. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for uh, uh, coming here virtually to uh listen to me. Uh, I hope I will be um, coherent. Uh, I'm in Singapore on a sabbatical and it's midnight here, but I think I'll be okay. So uh, I wanted to start with um, something um, super simple and I'm not totally sure uh, what um, uh, what's the majority of students uh, here, uh, what do they know, what they, do they don't know. Uh, it'll be something really simple. So um, I just wanted to show um, uh, continuous equations uh, for working with, um, uh, with transport and mechanics of uh, actomizing mesh, uh, which uh, is filling the cell and uh, enabling the cell to move, to divide, to uh, keep its shape. So um, uh, of course, in 20 minutes, I cannot uh, be systematic. I'll just give you a flavor uh, and uh, I will list a few uh, our, of our recent papers. And uh, of course, uh, like if you're interested, go to the papers and look up the details. So let's start with the following. Uh, we have um, actin filaments, right? Which are mechanically uh, elastic rods. Uh, filaments, of course, are not permanent. They turn over, meaning they polymerize, depolymerize, assemble, disassemble. For the purposes of today's talk, uh, we don't need uh, detailed biochemistry or um, uh, detailed mechanics. It's basically each individual filament uh, appears with certain rate and disappears uh, with certain rate randomly. And so together those filaments uh, create the gel. And the gel, uh, of course, doesn't consist only of uh, filaments. There are also crosslinkers. Uh, and the crosslinkers, two types of them are uh, shown here. They're basically also uh, small um, elastic proteins with uh, two actin binding uh, domains at the ends, right? So they uh, can serve as a glue between um, uh, actin filaments. Now, the key is that uh, this glue is not permanent. Uh, those cross links are dynamic. They um, uh, their ends bind with certain rate and unbind with certain rate, right? So uh, at the top of this slide, uh, what is shown is um, uh, some uh, elementary process uh, happening in, in this uh, cross-linked actin gel. So uh, let's say we have two filaments in the beginning, right? One of them will randomly stay, another will uh, randomly disappear, disassemble, and then, uh, another one will assemble. Uh, meanwhile, uh, if we have um, a crosslink, right? What what happens? Uh, first, one of the ends of the crosslink can bind to one uh, of the filaments at random uh, with certain given rate. Then another end uh, can bind another filament at random as well. For simplicity, let's say that both ends cannot bind uh, to the same filament. And then, of course, each uh, of the uh, crosslinker ends can unbind with uh, certain rates. So uh, conceptually, uh, it's very simple to um, start simulating uh, many of those filaments together in 3D, treating them as elastic rods, uh, having crosslinks as effective springs, and introducing or not introducing uh, thermal fluctuations. Right, uh, so what you see at the uh, bottom of the slide is uh, uh, such simulation that um, uh, our um, very talented uh, graduate student, uh, Andre Maxian, uh, did recently. And so the idea is simply to start with a few hundreds, hundreds of a few thousands, maybe a few thousand filaments uh, that are turning over, put in these crosslinks. Uh, and uh, not only let uh, this mesh evolve, uh, but at the same time start deforming the volume in which this mesh is. And, and you can deform this volume either statically 
or dynamically with a certain frequency. And then you just compute uh, what are the stresses corresponding to the strains that you are imposing. So it sounds conceptually very simple. Of course, uh, to do it properly numerically is tremendously complicated, especially if you want to uh, simulate the fluid into which the cytoplasm, into which the filaments are immersed, and we did that. So uh, I'm not going to tell you the details. Uh, they are all uh, in uh, this paper. But uh, I wanted to tell you uh, the very simple uh, qualitative answer that uh, came out of this simulation. And uh, um, uh, the semi-quantitative answer is that effectively this terribly complicated impermanent mesh is equivalent to the so-called generalized Maxwell uh, mechanical element. So uh, what it means is actually uh, shown here. It's uh, a viscous dashboard. So it's a mechanical element such that if you pull with constant force, it will start flowing with constant, constant rate. And in parallel with this uh, simple uh, viscous dashboard, which roughly represents cytoplasm, not exactly, roughly, there are uh, three uh, more complicated elements in which there are spring in series with a dashboard. So uh, this Maxwell element, how, it, how does it work? When you pull on it, uh, on a very short time, it behaves like elastic spring, and then it starts flowing like a fluid. And um, why there is uh, such complexity? Well, uh, simply because uh, there are multiple uh, time and force scales in this system. I will only tell you about those three time scales. So there's super short time scale on the order of 0.1 seconds. That uh, is due to relaxation of individual uh, filaments, uh, actin filaments in uh, this system. Then the scale of about a second. That's uh, the scale of uh, uncross-linking and recross-linking of this mesh due to the fact that uh, normally uh, almost all cross-links in the cell come on and off on a scale of a second. And finally, on a scale of uh, tens of seconds, there's turnover of individual filaments and remodeling of the geometry of this network. So the bottom line here is that uh, we are kind of perfectly justified to treat uh, this complicated cytoskeletal mesh as a highly viscous fluid, as far as we are dealing with uh, times uh, of minutes or longer, right? If we are going to shorter times, it's much more complicated. But on the very long times, which are actually biologically relevant, it's just a uh, viscous fluid, maybe not um, specifically Newtonian fluid, but viscous fluid. Okay. So far, we were talking about uh, passive um, uh, fluid. Uh, the fun is that uh, this uh, actin gel is actually uh, active. And uh, the simplest and dominant uh, reason for its being active are molecular motors. Uh, and uh, the most ubiquitous of those is myosin. So this is the protein which uh, enables uh, our muscles to contract and enables our, us to, uh, to stay upright. So uh, here on this slide, uh, everybody remember it from high school. It's a very simple structure and the very simple principle of uh, muscle contraction, which is due to uh, uh, this individual uh, myosin uh, motor head making a repetitive power stroke and trying to get to the plus end of the uh, actin filament. Now in muscle, uh, there's this beautiful perfect structure in which uh, there are periodic walls and plus ends of actin filaments are uh, cantilevered into those walls and minus ends are inward. And so bundles of myosins trying to walk to a uh, plus n, of course, telescopically contract the, uh, um, the circular. Now, uh, one of the most exciting uh, still open questions in uh, biophysics of the cytoskeleton is uh, how can you generate a contraction like this if you have uh, some completely random mesh of uh, actin filaments. Uh, 
So specifically, let's consider the following problem. This is completely random mesh of actin. And let's look at two filaments that are part of this mesh. Let's say that um, there's a tiny bundle of myosin with some heads trying to walk to the plus end of one filament, and other heads trying to walk to the plus ends of another filament. So uh, what I'm about to tell you is uh, uh, not uh, our original thought. The pioneering idea belongs to Margaret Gardell, uh, Martin Lenz, and a number of other researchers uh, who discovered uh, how um, elasticity of actin filaments uh, can break uh, a certain symmetry, which I will show you in the next slide. But what I will show you is uh, our um, recent uh, calculation of something uh, which is actually even simpler than what they did. They talked about uh, buckling of filaments, and I will only be talking about bending of the filaments. You can see the uh, details in this paper. So let's first pose the question. Here's the question. Let's say we start with two absolutely rigid filaments. Uh, so the, uh, those little uh, dots uh, at the ends uh, show plus ends. And uh, this blue thingy is a bundle of myosin filaments. So let's start with this initial configuration, right? And then uh, symmetrically and equally, myosin filaments, uh, sorry, myosin motors will try to uh, walk to the plus ends. Right, so they keep walking, basically uh, moving the uh, crossing point uh, along the filaments. Right, so the, what I show is not a schematic, it's actual uh, result of the simulation for two rigid filaments, which are also interacting with multiple uh, other passive filaments that are not shown in this picture. So why I want to show this uh, very simple example is because we are not generating any contraction this way, right? Uh, what you started with uh, has the moment of inertia the, pretty much the same as uh, in the end. You simply reshuffle filaments uh, from one point uh, to another. Nothing happens, okay? Uh, the key is to consider filaments that are bending uh, and elastic. And uh, then what happens is this is the sequence of the simulations. And what I'm not showing is that if you at the same time compute the um, resulting uh, stress that uh, this process of uh, gliding a filaments from one um, point to another generates, you will see that there's net contraction. So the net contraction is rather small, but still there's a net contraction. And the qualitative explanation is uh, very beautiful. And uh, again, I emphasize that qualitative idea is not ours. It was pioneered by Gardel Lenz and others. Uh, but in this simulation, it's uh, actually can be seen very beautifully what, what happens. The thing is that uh, as the myosins walk along filaments, the filaments start bending. And it's kind of intuitively clear, right? They uh, will be coming convex up first because uh, like the um, far away plus ends are lagging and uh, this point is uh, starting to move fast. Uh, what is the key is uh, what's happening at the end. At the end, it is so hard for uh, moving uh, myosins to push those filaments apart that instead they uh, change the curvature of the filaments and effectively zipper uh, the filaments together without pushing them apart. So in the second part of this process, the filaments are making an extension, they're pushed apart. In the first part, they're pulled together. And so this second part, the extension part, um, is not as effective as the first part. Instead of uh, for instead of myosin, myosins pushing the uh, filaments together, they simply bend the filaments and not increasing the moment of inertia. And in the end, you see that the filaments are kind of closer together than in the beginning. Okay, so if you do it rigorously, you will see that there's not contraction. Now, whether this process is actually happening in uh, Cytoskeleton, we don't really know. Uh, what makes me suspicious that it's not that simple is that the resulting contractile stress you get this way is really minuscule. 
compared to what we see in actual cytoskeleton. So the real answer could be much simpler. It could be that myosins are actually hanging out uh, on uh, placents, creating kind of mini asters in which myosins are sticking apart. So another mini asters can come and make much more effective contraction. Who knows? It's still um, a relatively open question. So uh, at this point, I wanted to um, uh, very briefly uh, transition from microscopic problems that I discussed so far to macroscopic problem. So let's say, uh, forget the individual filaments, individual mice and motors. Let's say we're dealing with micron, cubic microns and tens of cubic microns, scale of the cell. Uh, it would be uh, really hard to uh, model um, cytoskeleton on this scale microscopically. It would be good to come up with some macroscopic equations. So let me actually skip this slide. I, um, I'm moving too slowly and skip this slide. Ah, no, this slide, uh, let me tell you a few words. So uh, how you start modeling, uh, the idea is very simple. You start with two fundamental law of nature's, laws of nature. Uh, one is uh, conservation of mass, uh, which in this case means transport, right? Transport plus reaction. So we have diffusion and we have directed motion, drift or flow, and we have multiple reactions. And so we basically uh, do the proper accounting of all the molecules in the cytoskeleton and uh, this will be one part. The second part is do proper force balances. And in, inside cytoskeleton, there are roughly three forces. Uh, there's this active contractile stress created by myosins, for example. There's this effective uh, internal viscosity. And there are uh, external uh, viscous or elastic uh, or other kind of passive forces, for example, uh, between active mesh uh, being dragged along uh, the surface and uh, there's protein friction and there's this effective force. And so uh, then the force balance equation can be written in most of the cases in, in the following way. There's this external force, uh, I'll call it F adhesion. There's viscous force and myosin force. Okay. And uh, adhesion force uh, very often can be very well approximated by uh, just some constant times the uh, local velocity of actin mesh with sine minus. So it's just viscous friction. Why is that? Well, because if you uh, look at this cartoon, I'm not going to describe it, but think about it. Like if we move actin filament uh, tied to something by a crosslink and this crosslink is elastic and unbinds in time tau then you can derive very simple formula that this force will be proportional to the velocity. Then viscous uh, force, where is it coming from? Well, as usual, viscous, for, viscous stress is uh, viscosity coefficient time, times uh, spatial derivative of the velocity. And then the force is spatial derivative of the stress. So this is viscous force. And finally, uh, myosin stress. Um, it's a very interesting uh, open question uh, what myosin stress is equal to. Um, curious people should read uh, recent uh, articles by um, uh, Michael Merrill, um, who actually started to measure this. But the simplest assumption would be that myosin stress is simply proportional to local myosin density. And so the force, uh, myosin force, should be a spatial derivative. And then we arrive uh, at this fundamental equa equation, which appears in all the uh, active gel theories, soft matter theories, uh, mecha biophysical mechanics. So uh, it's basically a balance of three forces, viscous, active contractile stress, and um, uh, pa uh, passive uh, adhesive force. So uh, you see that there are two unknowns here, velocity and myosin density, right? And so for myosin density, what we have is some transport equation. For example, we could have diffusion drift equation, 
if uh, myosin largely drift with, drifts with actin and maybe diffuses uh, a little, meaning unbinding, floating in the cytoplasm and binding in another place. And I'm being, of course, extremely uh, glib here, kind of uh, glossing over uh, lots of complicated issue. You can derive those equations much more rigorously than I'm doing here. So note also that I wrote the uh, force balance equation uh, in the strange uh, form. I just wanted to uh, resemble the um, so-called um, uh, diffusion reaction equation, right? In a way, uh, you can think about it this way. Uh, viscous term is a diffusion term for velocity. Myosin, the derivative, is a source term and uh, friction is a sink term, right? So you have beautiful uh, diffusion reaction uh, equation. So you have diffusion reaction and you have uh, diffusion drift. So uh, as I thought, uh, I'm running out of time. What I wanted to do is uh, to show you uh, what are the simple things you can do here. Of course, uh, what you can do is linear stability analysis. Note that, um, well, first you of course can non-dimensionalize, you can read those uh, slides after the lecture is over. You can think about three uh, non-dimensional parameters that everything depends on. And uh, you can realize that uh, there's a trivial solution to this system, of course, depending on boundary condition. Uh, and this trivial solution is that myosin is uniform and there's no velocity anywhere, right? So it's a completely uh, boring passive isotropic system, but is this stable? So you, uh, what you can do is uh, add small perturbations to the stationary solutions, linearize the resulting equations. And there are a few slides of absolutely trivial calculations, which uh, I encourage you to uh, read at home and analyze. And the bottom line here is that uh, there's a relatively simple criterion for instability, which says that if uh, myosin contraction is stronger than critical, then this trivial uh, equilibrium will be broken and you will have contraction. And then of course you can solve uh, those equations numerically. And uh, here are uh, two solutions and that's what I wanted to finish with. So, um, what is very interesting is, uh, yeah, the blue, blue thing here is uh, concentration of uh, myosin and uh, red thing is the uh, velo resulting velocity. So uh, if you have the condition, uh, du dx is equal to zero at the boundary. It's kind of no flux for velocity at the boundary. Uh, it roughly means that uh, there are no special forces at the end of the interval, then myosin uh, aggregates to the center of the domain and velocity is distributed like this. Now, what I wanted to draw attention to, it will be important in the research part of the talk, is how the, does the profile of the velocity looks like? Um, well, it's roughly linear uh, gradient of the velocity across the place where myosin is. Right, what does it mean? Very simple, it's the so-called telescopic contraction. That's how muscle contract. The velocity at the left moves to the right, the ve velocity at the right moves to the left. So thing, thing, things keeps contracting, right? And the slope here is uh, roughly equal to uh, myosin density at the center. And in the place where there's no myosin, Velocity is not dropping to zero, it's becoming flat. Why? Because the um, cytoskeleton is viscous and you pull it somewhere. And if there's very little uh, friction elsewhere and no myosin, it moves kind of like a solid chunk of solid, right? So it moves with roughly constant velocity inward. Now, why do we have aggregation to the center? because there's some small friction relative to the surface when myosin contracts. 
And effectively, you can think about it this way. This mice in aggregate is a generator of force and it's pooling, right, locally at the center. Now, um, it effectively pulls against the surface. So if this uh, mice in aggregate shifts this way, it will be pulling at the right part way more than at the left. And there's effective centering force here, right? So this is a mechanism uh, why in many stationary cells, mice in aggregates to the center and there's centripetal uh, movement of cytoskeleton to the center, right? Uh, like here, right? Mice in at the center and the flow is centripetally symmetric to the center. But if you introduce uh, different boundary conditions so that velocity is zero at the boundary, meaning there's uh, effectively super high friction uh, at the very ends of the interval, then the mizen will aggregate to the end, either left or right, depending on initial condition, and velocity will have this profile. Uh, and the reason is that now the mizen pulls much harder against the ends rather than uh, the distributed surface. And if initially you have mice and aggregate a little bit closer to the left, it will be effectively pulling more at the left and moving to the left away from the right. This is uh, one of the beautiful um, well-known um, mechanisms for um, mechanical self-polarization of the cell, which uh, enables the cell to start movement. movement. So uh, if there's a very strong adhesion at the periphery of the cell, which is normally the case, mice and aggregate from the center moves to, to one of the sides, the structure of the flow changes and the cell starts to move directionally. So that's pretty much all I wanted to tell you uh, in the uh, first tutorial part of the talk. Uh, if you want, uh, we can answer a couple of questions, organizers decide or jump right into the research part and I'll answer all the questions at the end. What do you guys think?